Christine, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Why don't we start with uh, a little bit of your background and uh, your history on the Hill and before that, and then uh, where you are today. Sure. I started my career right out of college. I was on the committee called Government Operations. It's now a subcommittee, uh, but it was the committee that has jurisdiction essentially over the entire operations of government. And what's really fun about that is that you can get into all kinds of issue areas. So I learned a ton about state and local government relations and inspectors general and essentially how government works. And I was able to then take that experience after several years in the House, went to the Senate, worked on the Governmental Affairs Committee. That's now known as the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. It's much more known as the Homeland Security Committee, but it's also a committee that has very broad jurisdiction. And from there, I went to work on the White House Domestic Policy Council staff under the George W. Bush administration. And then on to my current position with the Partnership for Public Service, where I'm the Vice President for Government Affairs and I oversee our advocacy and policy agenda. Great. Why don't we start a little bit with your time on the Hill originally and being a staffer. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? You know, and did it change over time? Was it the same when you started as when you left? And was the House much different than the Senate? Can you give us a little flavor of, of how that progression went? It's a great question. And it's interesting you did not plant those questions because boy, I have all kinds of things to say on that. So I will try to keep it very brief and happy to answer any follow-up. I started in the House when uh, I was on a Republican staff and Republicans were in the minority and had been in the minority for decades. And it was interesting to see how little authority and power we had to set the agenda for the committee hearings, for the oversight activities. There was oversight we did and could do, but being in the minority was a very different experience, which uh, it became clear to me when we suddenly became the majority party in the 20 1994 elections. And it was unexpected. And we had a mock markup, mock business meeting very early before, when we first organized because the members of our committee had never been in the majority and never had to run a hearing as or a markup as the chair. And that was a really fascinating experience where we had the parliamentarians come and sit with us and help us be in that position of actually running the hearing. So having set the having the opportunity to set the agenda, be on the floor for many pieces of the uh, of the legislative priority list that year was really fascinating to give me a whole insight into how supportive the, the floor staff are and how good they are. Um, the, the professionals who work in the offices of the clerk and other places that are not political staff, but are people who are essential to making the place run. Incredibly interesting. Um, from there, my chairman was retiring and rather than stay with the new chairman, I decided to try my uh, luck in the Senate and had a brand new appreciation for the Senate. Um, we always thought in the House that the Senate wanted to just kill all of our good ideas. And once I got there, I really understood how truly essential it is to get bipartisan support because you're not gonna move legislation uh, given the 60 to vote threshold unless you have at a minimum some neutrality on the part of, of the other party. So um, it was a very good lesson for me and working across the aisle and compromise and how different the two bodies at that time were. I, I see a little bit less of that today and we can talk about that. Um, and then had a was very fortunate to have an opportunity to work on the Domestic Policy Council staff and to see from the executive branch side how the executive branch engages with, with Congress and ways that that process works, could work better um, and the different behind the scenes actors at the center of government like OMB that wield incredible influence yet are very uh, poorly understood and even unknown by and large among the American public. So can you talk a little bit about the, the, the way, or I guess it would be the, the kind of day-to-day -day role you had when you were on the executive branch, like what kind of activities were happening in that, in that 
in your role and what would be kind of, would you go to the Hill physically and talk to people or was it remote? Was it on the phone? And were you trying to help shape policy and bills or was it more just high level communication? Can you give us a sense for what that role and what that job really is? The, the, it was really two jobs before 9-11 and after 9-11. I went over there to work on specifically on an executive order that was uh, in a topic area that I had worked on as a policy you know, matter on the committees that I had worked on. So we went over there, I was over there pr primarily working on that issue, but much like a, in a congressional office, people on the staff will have a portfolio of issues that they're working on. And one of the issues I worked on at a very minimal level was postal service and postal reform. That took up a tiny amount of my time it's amazing how many lobbyists there are in postal. I, I met with a lot of people. It wasn't a great deal of policy emphasis. And really, we're there to try to execute the president's agenda and what the president wants to get done. After 9-11, the job really changed. The entire center of government became oriented towards recovery and response and, and preventing something like that from ever happening again. You may remember that 9-11 was closely followed by the anthrax attacks. That's where some of my postal work and experience came in. So I remember sitting in meetings with some of the smartest scientists I'd ever you know, met talking about how little we actually know about anthrax and how, uh, how much it exists just in that. Like you can find it on farms today. It doesn't necessarily connote an attack. So the difficulty of detecting anthrax and then determining is that an attack or not? And how do we know that? And how do we allow mail to be delivered to the Capitol complex and to the White House? These are democratic institutions. People need to communicate with their representatives. How can we do that safely when the mail had been used as a means of delivering a deadly weapon essentially to, to Capitol Hill? So incredibly interesting um, challenges incredibly important work. And it felt to me very rewarding in that the public was supporting public service and what public servants were doing. The lines of partisanship largely dissolved because of the national urgency to respond to the crisis that we had. Um, I see something very different today. And that's one of the reasons we have launched, along with some other good government organizations, an effort called Capital Strong to just let congressional staff know that we are supporting them in this period of post-insurrection when it's a, a very difficult time to, to work there. Unlike 9-11, we do not have a message of national unity. We don't have leaders who are really coming together and, and setting that tone for the nation and for people working in public service. Um, on Capitol Hill. So that's a long answer to your question, but it was really a, a fascinating experience. I learned a lot about working with OMB, um, but it was a very different job after the 9-11 attacks. So why don't we talk more about what you're doing now um, at Partnership? Can you kind of in introduce that and in, in the different areas of work as it relates to Congress? I'm happy to. So the Partnership for Public Service was founded as an organization dedicated to a more effective government. And we started primarily focused on people, the need to get great new talent serving in public service and all different roles, the challenge of getting those people in place. But we've since expanded our footprint over the years to look at things that contribute to an effective government beyond just people, but the, uh, the organizations and, and systems in which people are having to work. So for example, we are keenly interested in leadership and the important tone that leaders set. We know from the best places to work rankings that we do that how people regard their leaders is the number one driver of employee engagement. And there's a high correlation between employee engagement and organizational performance. So in other words, if we want government to work better, we need to have better leaders who know how to engage their workforces and get the best out of those people. We clearly need to get some of the hiring processes fixed and 
find ways to inspire people to return to public service or to try public service for the first time. There are many mission critical jobs that go unfilled. It's difficult to keep people. Um, I believe it's over half of people who are hired into public, into the executive branch today, leave within two years. And that's a problem. So, so why is that happening? We think that there are issues around technology. They're operating under old outdated technology. There's a, a uh, contributing factor on Capitol Hill, which we can talk about. Um, and it's difficult to collaborate across, across silos. And yet many people today, and especially young people, they want that, that opportunity to work with other people to solve problems. And it's harder to do that than it needs to be. So government government has made some great strides. We have programming and research and advocacy in all of the areas that I just mentioned, but there's much more to be done. And why we're involved now getting doing more around Congress is that we have looked across all of these challenges that face the executive branch and identified a contributing factor on the legislative grant side, whether that is the difficulty that Congress has reauthorizing programs. DHS has never been reauthorized. Um, that's a problem. It means they're operating under a statute that dates to 0304. The difficulty of passing appropriations bills on times. It's been over 20 years since they've passed appropriations bills on times on time. Leaving Senate confirmed positions vacant for months and even years at a time takes a toll on an agency and its ability to operate and to perform at the level at which we need it to perform. So all of these things that are not working well in Congress have a consequential impact for the executive branch. So that's why we are um, now dipping our toe into the water to do a little bit more around the health of Congress itself beyond the work we already do around the health of the executive branch. Excellent. So why don't we, of all those areas, why don't we take um, uh, appointments as a place to start? Um, can you talk a little bit about how that process is happening? Uh, you know, a little bit more of the detail of that. And then what do you see are the biggest problems inherent in that process? Now, obviously, this is something that's spelled out in the Constitution. The Senate has to do it. Um, how does it actually happen in practice? The way it happens in practice is that an administration will have an office of presidential personnel that works with the political team and the legislative team, figure out what, what kind of people do we need and all the positions available to fill. They will nominate someone after they've been vetted internally. Then the Senate will do its own vetting, hold a hearing, uh, usually for lower level positions, they may not hold a hearing and there are some exceptions, but generally they'll hold a hearing. They will ask um, questions both in the hearing. They will also often ask questions in a staff interview that happens outside of public view. And then they will vote on that person's nomination and committee. And if there's a favorable vote to advance them, they will go to the full Senate for consideration. And so for each of those steps, which steps are kind of transparent to the public and which ones are not? The, where most people find out about a president's choice to nominate is when that person is announced as a nominee. There's an intent to nominate and then the actual nomination. The actual nomination hap happens when that person's paperwork goes up. That's more of a formality. It's really the intent to nominate. With the typical administration, uh, and this is what the Biden administration is doing, they, they will do some vetting behind the scenes before they announce the person because they want to make sure that there are no red flags or surprises in that person's background before they announce them. And we have, for those who are interested in serving in a political appointment, we developed a website called Ready to Serve that explains this process because there are multiple types of political appointments. There are 4,000 that an administration has to fill. About 1,250 are Senate confirmed. That's a very high number, but uh, there are other ways to get appointment an appointment without the Senate confirmation appointments. Those are the most senior appointments, the Senate confirmed ones. What the, what the Trump administration did, and this is just the nature of, of that particular president, 
he would often meet someone and find he had a rapport, got excited about them for a particular job, and they would be announced before they had been vetted. And this really threw a lot of people for a loop because it was an aberration in a process that had been well understood and well established. People would go up to the Senate, their nomination would be submitted, and the Senate normally would expect that would be accompanied by a full package, meaning their ethics um, paperwork had been filled out and there had been some initial work with the Office of Government Ethics on that, their FBI background check was done, et cetera. Instead, the Senate was getting nominations where none of that had been completed. And so it really caused a, a, a challenging and rocky start for the Trump administration because of their nominees. The Biden administration is having a similarly rocky time, but for some different reasons. And in some ways it goes back to the, the delay caused by ascertainment um, in, in the election outcome that prevented the Biden team from getting access to FBI background investigation services for their nominees, you know, that stuff accrues. And then obviously there was the runoff and, and multiple other factors that have been contributing. But Biden has the most nominees of any president at this point, of any modern president at this point in his presidency, and yet by far the fewest confirmed people. I think they're only at 10 confirmations at this point, which is historically low among modern presidents. Um, oh. Oh, sorry. So that's so just it, just to finish your answering your question about transparency. Um, the uh, other things the public does not see are the nominees' conversations with senators, uh, especially for senior positions. Nominees will usually meet with the senators on that committee and possibly others to try to assure them that they uh, have a have a will have a friend at the agency and that they will work collaboratively. And then some committees hold a staff interview which gives the staff an opportunity to really get to know on, the, on a policy level, the views of that nominee, and it helps them prepare for the public hearing. Great, and so in your experience, when the Senate is, whether it's committee, the committee or the staffer, the committee members or the staffers, when they're looking at these appointees, um, what are the criteria by which they're judging them? Is it, you know, is it fitness for the job? Is it uh, a vision for the the agency? Is it, you know, political considerations? Is it, you know, what are the factors that go into that decision? I mean, there's the ideal factors and then there's the real ones, you know, can you give a sense for how that process works or is it totally different from committee to committee, person to person? It's, it's all of the above. And it varies from Senator to Senator, committee to committee. There is a, a culture on each committee that is different. And the Armed Services Committee is, I'll use as an example of a committee that is highly bipartisan in its approach to nominations. They confirm general officers as well. So not just civilians, but they have to confirm the general officers. And they really do approach it in a, in a fairly bipartisan way. Um, and they're looking for fitness for the job. Having said that, there are always going to be considerations of that are parochial in nature, for example. Um, the uh, late Senator Ted Stevens and um, the late Senator Daniel, in uh, Daniel Inouye uh, and Daniel Akaka as well, also of Hawaii, were uh, well known for asking questions about how that nominee would respond to issues that were of particular interest to Alaskans or Hawaiians. Um, and the uh, interesting things that they would often invite or request that nominees come to their state. Dan Sullivan, the current, one of the current senators from Alaska is well known for asking nominees to make a trip to Alaska to visit whatever facility, whether it's a VA facility for a veterans nominee uh, or, or whatever other you know, agency is in mind because he wants to make sure that those people are going to be responsive to his state. So it really runs the gamut. And then you'll obviously see people who are, um, you know, end up withdrawing their nomination or being withdrawn for reasons that are not about their qualifications, but are about issues in their background that were not well known until they came to light through the hearing process or because of things that we're seeing this in the news today, 
things that they had tweeted and been active on social media, you know, become controversial at some point in time. So it's very, it's treacherous territory because things that people might have written in law school come back to haunt them 20 and 30 years later when they're being considered for a position that might have nothing to do with what they even wrote about. So it, it really, it really depends on the climate in which that confirmation hearing is occurring and the broader, the broader ecosystem um, of negotiations between the branches and, and whether there's a desire to compromise or a desire to have a win, score a win. So anyway, a lot, a lot goes into it. And from your perspective, are there ways that you think that whole process could be improved? We have a lot of ideas for that process. Um, one of the ideas that we have is to make sure that nominees are well prepared for what the process entails. Many people are excited about going into public service, especially in a, in a political appointment. They don't really understand that they're going to be asked to make, in some cases, very significant financial sacrifices um, as a result of that service because they need to divest themselves from certain assets or whatever. There have been multiple examples of people who have said yes to public service and then found that they could not extricate themselves from their family business or whatever business holdings or personal commitments they might have. Um, and that's too bad because we want great people to serve in government, but they, they need to know what they're getting into going in. It's, it's a, one of the best jobs people will ever have. It's also very demanding. And there's a public trust aspect of it that is unique. Uh, what makes this more challenging is that the sheer number of positions subject to Senate confirmation means it's, it's almost more than the Senate can process in a reasonable amount of time, particularly in an environment where uh, nominations are not getting a rubber stamp. Every nomination is being scrutinized and there's often extended and prolonged debate on nominations. So 1,250 give or take nominations is more than could get confirmed by the Senate in a year, even if the Senate did nothing else. So we would like to see fewer positions subject to Senate confirmation. Congress did this on a bipartisan, bicameral basis in 2011, 2010, 20, I think it started 2010, basically through 2012. And that yielded um, a list of a, you know, close to 170 positions that were converted from Senate confirmed to non-Senate confirmed and another 200 or so positions that were put on something that was created called the privileged calendar. And the privileged calendar was intended as a way to expedite nominees for non-controversial positions, largely boards and commissions, but for constitutional reasons, there was still the requirement that they be Senate confirmed. Um, it was also used for some other positions like chief financial officer that shouldn't be heavily political partisan positions because they're more management in nature. Um, that hasn't worked as intended. So we'd like to, to do more to fix that. Um, so anyway, those are just a few of the ideas that we're, that we're uh, hoping to get some traction on. And are all those positions um, necessary, I guess, is one of the questions is, is part of the motivation for not filling certain positions because some people think they shouldn't exist? That's a fantastic question. And the, uh, we did a report on this very issue late last year called The Replacements, and it looked at the impact of having so many vacancies in senior level positions. And what we found is that in some cases, the position has been vacant so long and filled by a career person in the absence of, an, of a confirmed leader, that it really makes us question, do we need that position to be Senate confirmed? If the agency is executing on its mission effectively and successfully and has done so for literally years, just do we need to try to fill that with a Senate confirmed role? Could we just convert that job? So that would be one way to, to think about it. Um, another way to think about it is the, the vacancies are a reflection of an administration's priorities and what's important to them. The uh, Trump administration chose not to fill positions related to climate, for example, to climate change. That's a reflection of the administration's priorities. The, um, the president also chose, President uh, Trump chose not to fill some positions related to uh, 
human rights in North Korea because he was working through his State Department and through other positions. So in some cases, it's not that he doesn't think the position is important, that the, that the policy area is not important, but maybe that position is not the position he wants to use to try to execute the policy. It might be somewhere else. So this is what the Biden team is doing right now. They're making strategic decisions about the positions they want to fill, the priority that they're giving those positions. They've moved very quickly to fill the deputy roles faster than most administrations. So I think they're signaling an interest in getting strong leaders in place. And I expect to see that those leaders uh, of the agencies getting some sway over who fills the Senate confirmed slots below them. And who ultimately uh, could change that, that whole process in those positions is the Senate itself. If a position Senate confirmed, it's done so in law and the law needs to be changed to, to, to change the status of those positions. So the administration can't, this is not one of the things that, the, that President Biden can do with an executive order or a presidential memorandum. At the same time though, it, this is an area where collaboration and cooperation between the branches is critically important because the administration and the House and Senate working on this together would give it some staying power and would yield at the end of the day, probably a better and longer list than, than either of the branches trying to, to attempt this on their own. Got it. So it would need to go through both chambers and the president in order to, to change. Right. Got it. Great. Well, let's, let's move on to another topic, which is oversight. Uh, so you've spent a lot of time on oversight and from both sides of both sides of it, from the executive uh, side and the, and the legislative side. And we've talked previously with the Levin Center uh, about oversight, but primarily from an investigations point of view. Uh, I think there's the kind of the regular oversight of the Congress sort of making sure that the executive branch is doing what the law says it's supposed to do. Uh, and an ongoing kind of maintenance of that information. Um, can you talk about your experience and oversight from sort of both sides and how does it work? How does the information flow? What works, what doesn't? Sure, that's a big question. And there are a lot of, of aspects to congressional oversight. So I'll just share a, a few thoughts at a high level and we can take the conversation wherever you think most helpful. Um, often oversight issues are surfaced by constituents. And this is a place that I think is underappreciated, but the number of people who reach out to their congressional offices for help with an agency, you know, first of all, it's, it's a fantastic service um, that members of Congress play. And it, and it is often uh, a constituent who's coming to the member of Congress as a last resort because they've not been able to get what they need from a federal agency and they're hard places to navigate. They're getting better. There's a lot of great work going on around customer service, but it's still often a place that um, a congressional office can really help a constituent with. So I'll, I'll give you one example. You know, we had a constituent, one of my first um, real oversight uh, efforts was hearing from a constituent who's having a challenging issue with uh, legal services corporation. And so that led me to get to know a little bit more about the organization, but also the inspector general there and what the IGs look at. So what I learned is that Congress relies on a number of really professional capable bodies to support it in its oversight. So whether that's trying to figure out how on a routine matter agencies are performing or whether it's an investigation, which is more the focus of the Levin Center, offices like the Inspectors General, the General Accounting, excuse me, Government Accountability Office, it shows my, I call it General Accounting Office is what it used to be called, it's now Government Accountability Office, Congressional Research Service. Uh, offices like this are enormously helpful when Congress is trying to understand what's happening in these agencies and are there changes that are needed to make them work better? What's the consequence of having an absence of leaders? Um, the Ways and Means Committee held a hearing on that very topic around, about the Social Security Administration. You know, what, what does it mean for the performance of this agency when there are vacancies at a senior level? And these are places where 
the support agencies that are around Congress um, can be enormously helpful to fill out that oversight, um, you know, sort of scorecard. Scorecard is not the right word, but really they give a more complete picture than congressional staff could get on their own. Well, I guess if we could go a little bit deeper on the, on the sort of the system by which Congress is collecting information about what the executive branch is doing, right? So we talk about constituents, obviously they can come in through sort of the back door of the, of the, um, of a member to complain about what's happening with a particular, um, with a particular agency, but the, the unit of oversight seems to be the committee or the subcommittee, right? And so ultimately that subcommittee or that committee is, needs to be I, I, executing a number of oversight actions, right? And, and one of those is collecting information from constituents. Another one is maybe collecting information from the executive branch itself, maybe through some of the mechanisms you talked about. I, I guess my question is, is there any kind of formal mechanism by which these subcommittees uh, or committees are collecting this information about their their areas of oversight. There, are, there are formal um, formal means of sharing information and that that inform the process. But having said that, oversight hearings and ideas come from all over the place, including the media. Um, I actually worked with someone who got an idea for an oversight hearing that he got from Rolling Stone magazine. Um, it actually was a very well covered hearing. There's some celebrities at that hearing. Very interesting. Uh, there are, I guess, a, a place I would start um, is the president's budget request. So every year the president will submit a budget request. And along with that, they have something called the congressional budget justifications that explains basically the explainer. Like, what are we asking for? Why? Why do we need this? Why, why is this our request for our level of funding? And the budget's also in. Uh, accompanied by something called the analytical perspectives. And that is just a treasure trove of information, um, including foreshadowing the administration's plans on different management issues. So we spend a lot of time looking at that. What are their plans for workforce? What are their plans for technology? Um, so they will, you know, the committees will be looking through all of that material to determine how, does, how do these issues align with the priorities of that particular chairman and the areas that that chairman's interested in digging into? How does that align with the districts of certain members on the committee? Um, but also what's in the news? What do people care about? What are people worried about? And those are the, gonna be the issues at the end of the day that drives oversight. What I think is unfortunate is that because the members are pulled in many different directions, there's a finite amount of time. There's never enough time to do all the oversight on all of the issues within the jurisdiction of a committee. That there are, you know, there are organizations and offices and agencies that just slip through the cracks and don't get regular oversight until there's a failure, until something goes wrong. I think we're seeing this now with the Capitol Police that there has been, there have been very few just general oversight hearings on the Capitol Police. Outside of the, I should mention the appropriations process is another place where some of these agencies might get their only opportunity for the year to be before Congress and answering questions. And that's in the context of their budget requests very specifically. So if that's the only time that they're, that they're coming before Congress and Congress is really spending a lot of time on them, over the years, it's not surprising that there is going to be an issue that, uh, you know, for whatever reason results in some kind of a massive failure that then becomes the center of attention. So rather than being better than using oversight to prevent problems, it's often trying to diagnose what happened and how to fix it going forward. That's where inspectors general and GAO can be really helpful. The GAO high risk list that's going to be coming out very soon is a a really valuable document. Everybody on Capitol Hill pays attention to it. And it is an early warning system that these are areas at risk of waste, fraud, abuse, system failure on a, on a massive or very large and consequential level, and they need attention. I know when I was on the committee, we regularly had a hearing on the high risk list itself that featured GAO to talk through these issues, but then we would pick discrete 
issues on the list, for example, the strategic management of people in government was added to their list several years ago. So we would spend time on hearings just on those topic areas because they are complex and they defy easy solutions, but they, they need that time and investment to, and depth of understanding that you get from just staying with it and, and asking hard questions. Mm -hmm.